Peter was constantly the cheerleader during his time at Cornell, and that ability to be a cheerleader and to involve himself with hundreds of people at any one time has remained throughout his life. I'm Peter Eisenman, uh, Cornell class of 54, architecture 55. Peter loves the telephone. Uh, he loves calling his friends, not only in America, but all over the world. But he always finds a way of calling them when they're half asleep so that he has the upper edge. He has the ability to say, hey, what's happening? And uh, he said, what? Oh, Peter, uh, I haven't thought about what's happening yet. And Peter uh, wants to know and wants you to know uh, that he's in the forefront of whatever's going on. Peter is the kind of friend you have to embrace because he's a conscience and he forces you to confront the questions that you try to avoid. And I think his passion and his um, risk-taking in life has always been a model, actually, for all of us who know him well, uh, who are both intimidated by him, provoked by him, uh, and stimulated by him. My dorm counselor in Founders Hall was an architect. I'd never heard of architecture before. I knew nothing about it. And I used to go down and watch him. And when I was growing up in the 40s in New Jersey, a boy never took art. We took auto mechanics and shop, but art and that sort of stuff, nobody ever did that. And I said, and I asked this guy, I said, you mean to say Bill Troutman was his name? I said, you mean to say you can come here at a university and draw and make models? And he said, yeah, that's what I do. And I said, oh my God, this is what I want to do. I mean, this is fantastic. I finally realized I, that's something I really wanted to do. So I went to see Dean Mackesy, Tom Mackesy, and I said, I want to be an architect. And Tom looked at my record, and I was on probation because I was failing German. And he said, well, you've got to f pass everything. And I said, look, I really got to get in to architecture. He said, oh, I got it. He said, I'll take you, but you've got to pass your courses. I came back spring vacation of my freshman year. And I said to my parents, the day I was leaving, an hour before, I gathered them in the living room, not in the sun parlor, because big things happened in the living room in our house. And I said, I, I need to talk with you. And uh, I said, I have something to tell you. Well, they were just shocked. And so I said, I, I want to tell you something. I have an announcement today. I'm going to be an architect. He said, is this another one of your jokes? And I said, no, I'm very serious about it. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, you know I don't believe in university education, even though I had one and I have a master's degree. Um, I think people ought to go out and work. He said, I'll give you one more year at Cornell in architecture. If you don't do well, you're out on the street. No Rutgers, no nothing. You go to work. And that was a gauntlet that he laid down. And he was serious. He was a tough guy. Uh, and then one of the great crises came up in my sophomore year. Uh, we had been an undefeated freshman swimming team, and I was now in architecture and swimming on the swimming team. And Scotty Little, the coach, we were going down to Yale. It was a big meet. And I was doing labs in the afternoon. I was coming in at 5 o'clock to do my laps. And the coaches were really upset with me. I was the fastest backstroker at Cornell. And I was supposed to make the trip. Going to Yale was a big deal. And Scotty came to me and he said, I'm not taking you to Yale. And I said, why is that? He said, because 
you, if you, you've got to make up your mind. You're either going to do architecture or you're going to swim, but you're not going to do both here. And that was amazing at that time. And I quit swimming in my sophomore year. Uh, I stopped swimming. Um, I had been swimming competitively since I had been seven years old. So this was the only identification I ever had in myself was swimming. We were state champions in high school, and I used to live through swimming. And so I gave it up for architecture, and I never looked back. I was uh, in a different group in the architecture school, because there were architects who were into architecture, and I was into the university in a certain way. I ended up being reunion chairman of my class. I was vice president of my class when we graduated of the whole university. Uh, I ran the first five-year reunion. Um, I was a cheerleader. I was the original Zelig. I was Mr. Fit In, right? Uh, there's nobody that was more Cornell gung-ho as, as a cheerleader. Um, you know, I was, you know, involved with all of those things at Cornell that made Cornell, other than architecture, what it was. All right. They were, all of the, the people that ran the place were my friends. And that was important to me. Werner Seligman was in my class. Werner was the prototypical architect, you know, great Corbu fan, knew all about architecture, despised Peter Eisenman and my ilk because we were Cornell types and he was an architect. I got the thesis prize. I won the Charles Goodwin Sands Memorial Medal and Werner got nothing. And he walked in and he collapsed in the room overwhelmed, collapsed, and they had to take him to the infirmary. They came with a stretcher and took Werner to the infirmary. He was so, because we had been up for three or four nights, he was, and he was psychologically so upset, not only losing, but losing to me, and I didn't think I was going to win anything. You have to understand, uh, I, I wasn't the type that won architectural things, right? Uh, and that was a, a really sort of, crowning moment at, at Cornell. I had a fabulous time at Cornell. I loved Cornell. And relative to, the, to, to his, his friends and people he, he, uh, he has contact with, including myself, he always has a, he always has a fresh take on things that uh, you wouldn't expect. Peter really started a, a true revolution about what architecture uh, should be concerned about, and I think is uh, promoted and 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 uh, and and made out of the whole discipline a, a body of knowledge that is by far larger than it was before he started. It's the greatest polemicist in the world. is a uh, incredibly talented man, fun to be with, and uh, a fair player. And I think is uh, very rare nowadays in our trade. I graduated in 55, and I was in ROTC, and I volunteered to go to Korea. I uh, went to Fort Sill, and we were in the artillery, and went to Korea three days after I graduated. It was no time, because we had to get there. I suddenly became uh, passionately interested in architecture, and I said, I must have said, because so, somebody reminded me of this, uh, who was with me in Korea at the officers club said I want to be a great architect someday uh, and that was in 56 or 57 and I had no idea what that meant I came back from Korea I went to work for Percival Goodman at Columbia and I went up to Boston to work for Gropius I came back to Columbia, I did a graduate year. I was with Mike McKinnell, who later won the Boston City Hall. And McKinnell and I were roommates, and Mike said, you know, Peter, you're a terrific designer, but you don't know anything about architecture. Uh, what you need to do is go to Europe and go to England. So I went to Cambridge, and I met Colin Rowe, 
in Cambridge, we became friendly and I would go over to Colin's place and he would show me books and open things up for me. And uh, really sort of, in a sense, changed my whole life. No, but also I've been spending the rest of my life trying to get out from under this change. Colin and I traveled together in the summer of uh, 61 uh, to Europe, and everybody thought we were gay. And I got a job after the summer of 62. I went back to Princeton. I got a job at Princeton. I got to Princeton. Michael Graves was there. He'd gotten there the year before, and the two of us were sort of a dynamic duo uh, and a kind of whole new idea of what Princeton could be. I was denied tenure at Princeton uh, after being there for four years. And I went to see Arthur, Arthur Drexler at the museum, who was then um, uh, a buddy. And I said to Arthur, I want to start an institute. I'd always had this idea of a halfway house between academia and, and uh, practice. And Jack Robertson and I had been buddies from Cambridge. And Jack had just gone to work for Lindsay. Jack gave us some projects. Burnham Kelly who was Dean at Cornell, was one of the, our trustees, and Burnham gave us students, and Colin. And I first met Peter Eisenman uh, when I was a sophomore in college. Uh, and one of the field trips we took was to New York City, uh, where we were taken to a then very new uh, institution uh, in Midtown Manhattan, across the street from Bryant Park, that we all came to know as the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies. In the midst of it all, of course, as impresario and circus master and thorn in one side was, of course, always Peter. And Peter constantly uh, challenging me, badgering me, chiding me uh, uh, to, to do more, to do better, uh, to wake up, to stop being so silly. Uh, uh, and uh, I, it's, it's not a unique relationship. I know other people have had that kind of relationship with Peter. The kind of voice that other people describe Peter's mentor, Colin Rowe, as having been, that even when he's not there, he's somebody that you feel looking over your shoulder, reading what you're writing. And I value that enormously, just as much as I value going to football games with him. I was uh, involved in the famous Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, more or less from the beginning. And um, I was one of the founder editors of the magazine Oppositions, which wouldn't have existed without Peter Eisenman. And uh, nor would the Institute for Architecture of Urban Studies exist existed without Peter Eisenman. So he's a provo provocateur, you know. Uh, I think halfway between provocateur and, as he likes to put it, souffle maker. I would say that ideologically, we don't agree about. We disagree almost about everything, but um, in terms of someone to uh, play with, so to speak, um, discuss with, you know, to 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 spar with, uh, he remains this incredible, stimulating figure. In 82, I, after the 15th anniversary of the Institute, I said, I can't do this anymore. I, I don't want to do this. And so Jack Robertson and I went into partnership. You know, we won a competition at Checkpoint Charlie. We won the Wexner Center competition. Um, Jack and I decided we were incompatible as architectural partners. And so I, I started Eisenman Architects. I'm now an architect. All of the things that happened to me, I believe, were good luck. I have an enormous amount of good luck. At the stadium that was in the Times yesterday, how did I get that? I'll give you uh, this, this thing. Uh, here, here you go. You want to see it? There you are. OK. There you go. Let me tell you how I got it. I mean, it's one of those chance things. A guy calls up. I'm calling because the Arizona Cardinals want to build a new stadium. He said, are you interested in football? I said, am I interested in football? I said, 
I have had Giants season tickets since 1957. He said, you know, it's, uh, this was in 1997, I guess. 1997. It's the 50th anniversary of the only time the Cardinals ever won the NFL championship. So you got to hear this. I said, I saw them play. And I'll tell you what I'll do further just to show you. I'll name the backfield. And I named for somehow pulled out of my head the backfield for the Cardinals of 1947, right? And this guy said, um, uh, I, I see, I, I, I better get back to you. So the guy calls back within two hours and he says, can you be in Cincinnati uh, on Sunday? Uh, the owners are gonna be there because the Cardinals are playing the, the Bengals. I said, yeah, I'll give up my giant tickets, but sure, yeah, I can do that. So I sat in the box with the owners and they said, done. Like, just like that. The fact that they got the money, 355 million bucks, that they're going to build this thing just like this is, to me, off the charts. I mean, you know, here is this crazy New York architect, you know, uh, who's a football monkey. You know, from that, we've gotten, I mean, I'm doing a stadium in a soccer stadium in Spain. We're doing the Olympic Stadium in Leipzig for the 2012 German bid. So these are things that just crazy things that happen. Um, they just... And how they happen, I couldn't tell you. How you. I've never gone and solicited a job. We've always gotten our jobs through winning competitions or, you know, nobody refers anybody. We, we don't just get jobs, right? Nobody says, here, Peter, we want you to do this. A lot of people that are feeling that is, and I'm still moving up. And so I, knock on wood, I'm as fast and as moving and as committed to my work as I've ever been. Peter is an amazing, persuasive, gifted builder, teacher, and actually liar, which is what I consider a compliment. I mean, he's, he invents stories that can keep one fascinated endlessly. Well, one of the things I think that makes Peter a great teacher uh, is his enthusiasm and the way in which uh, this sort of cheerleading aspect of things uh, is in his blood. Uh, he, he gets great pleasure out of you know, inciting the students to do something, be active, make something. And I think that his enthusiasm uh, for the art of architecture, and the way he transmits that to students, uh, is a wonderful thing. I want to tell you, just because I happen to be older than you and, and, and doesn't mean I'm wiser or uh, more knowledgeable, right? In fact, I'm probably more limited because it's very difficult to teach an old gorilla new tricks. First of all, when you get to be an old gorilla, you're going to be in the same situation I am, right? And what's interesting for me is to watch my, co my gorilla friends uh, on the downside. What do they, how do they behave? And most of them don't know how to deal with the downside of being a gorilla, right? Um, it probably goes for me too, but I don't see that I'm on a downside yet. So, uh, uh, and that, uh, that's why I, I love teaching this class. For my generation of of, uh, of of an architect and of a teacher and as a and and as a writer. Um, Peter somehow symbolized the capacity to change the game, that at some point you could rethink the assumptions, that you could challenge those assumptions. And in this sense, he was, I would say, if I say, what's the relationship? He, he's a teacher, right? a teacher to a generation. Some would say a teacher to maybe two, three, four generations. And, and his mission in life is not to be, not to be liked. His mission in life is to educate. And that's very special. We were colleagues. We were uh, sparring mates, intellectual sparring mates, all these different things. But now he's my employee. Peter is a wonderful architect and a, a, a very provocative brain. But most of all, he's an amazing teacher. I think any student today, um, lucky enough to study with Peter, 
um, uh, is going to have a, a, have a life changing, in the best possible sense of that phrase, experience. So he, at the peak of his uh, fame as an architect, already committed to teaching a, a studio here, took on a first year lecture course. And I don't, there's no course like this in the world, unless he might be teaching it somewhere else. Oh, I want to go back to the old days, those good old days on the A loving friend. I love him. I love him.